We saw in earlier episodes how Charles Lyell conspired with his friend George Scrope to set down what he called mosaic geology, meaning the Genesis Flood. After publication, he wrote to Charles Darwin, gloating that he had destroyed the book of Genesis without mentioning the Bible. The way he attacked the Bible was to claim that his uniformity principle was the only true basis for geology. That principle claims that no processes have happened in the past except what we see happening today. He based his whole time scale on the idea that sediments are being laid down at one-eighth of an inch, or three millimetres, every century, and it's always been the same since the beginning of time. He made a theoretical, or should we say mythical, stack of rocks more than 11 kilometres tall, he then deduced 600 million years of deposition in the oceans. So many secular humanists longed to be free from the Bible and its condemnation of their sin that they jumped on Lyle's story with joy. Of course, since the story is not true, geologists soon began finding things which show very clearly that it's not true. Things like fossilised tree trunks, 10 metres or 30 feet long, standing upright through layer after layer of sedimentary rocks. Obviously, if that sediment had been laid down at 3 millimetres a century, the wood-eating scavengers would have reduced it to powder before the first 3 millimetres was laid down. And what kept the tree trunks upright for all those thousands of years till the sediment would be deep enough to stop them falling over? These logs were obviously buried very quickly in a great flood of sediment. It's not uncommon to find footprints in rocks. Dinosaur footprints are particularly interesting to many people, but sometimes you find human footprints. There are many human footprints in Carboniferous rock, which Lyle's story dates at about 300 million years old. Albert Ingalls called this the Carboniferous Mystery. Ingalls admitted that they could not be forgeries, since, when clearing construction sites, new footprints are often found under the layer of rock just removed. He claimed, however, they could, they could not possibly be human footprints, because otherwise all the geologists should resign from their jobs and become truck drivers. Lyle claimed that fossils form when things die, fall to the bottom of the sea and get slowly covered with sediment. Here we can see a fish thrusting itself forward to gobble up a smaller fish. Before it could finish swallowing its prey, it was engulfed in such a huge mass of sediment that it couldn't move at all. Fish protein decays very quickly. But every fin and scale is in place. This fish was engulfed and fossilised before any decay could take place. There's an interesting piece of rock from a quarry outside a town called London in Texas, USA. The quarry has many palesipod fossils which are index fossils for the Ordovician period, supposedly 500 million years old. But there's something sticking out of this piece of Ordovician sandstone. It's wood, spruce, partly turned to coal. But spruce isn't supposed to have evolved until hundreds of millions of years later in the Triassic period. But when this rock was split open, it was found that the spruce is the handle of an iron hammer. In this one specimen, we have items from the bottom, the middle and the top of the geological column, showing that the whole column was laid down in a very short space of time. All these things fit in perfectly with the timescale of the biblical flood. And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. But they don't fit in at all with Lyle's timescale. 
About 30 years ago, I was invited to give a lecture at the annual general meeting of the South African Institute of Engineering Geologists. The greatest authority on engineering geology in the history of South Africa was in the audience. Professor Anthony Brink, the author of the standard textbook in four volumes. It's still the standard reference work on South African engineering geology. I gave a lecture in which I pointed out many instances of geological evidence proving that the time scale is untenable. At the end of all my lectures, I invite questions from the audience. On this occasion, nobody addressed a question to me. They addressed them to Professor Brink. The first question was, Professor Brink, is it true that things are found in the wrong order in the geological column? There was a rather embarrassed pause before he replied, well, we often find angiosperms in the Ordovician, and we sometimes even find them in the Cambrian. There was a stunned silence. Every geologist there realised that what Professor Brink had said wiped out the geological timescale as effectively as any of my examples. As the meeting broke up, a very senior geologist came to me and said, thank you for your lecture. Isn't it strange that it took a non-geologist to open our eyes to see the truth? I think I was not the only person at that meeting who looked forward to a new edition of Professor Brink's books. An edition which might at least admit some uncertainty about the timescale. But it never happened. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.